Welcome to today's program from Harvard Business Publishing. My name is Sandy Barber, and I'm the Associate Director of Educator Training and Development here at HBP, and I just want to thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, I just want to go through a few administrative items. First of all, if the Zoom volume is too low, it could be something with your system, so we suggest you check your system volume. Also, if you're having technical difficulties, I encourage you to log back out, log back in. Sometimes that just fixes the issue. If you're still having technical difficulties after that, and if you can possibly hear me uh, right now, I just want to let you know that we do, we are recording this webinar, uh, and you will receive access through an email and a link to the recording in the coming days. So if you have any questions today, uh, I know some of you have already submitted some and Ted mentioned this uh, when he was talking to you earlier. If you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A window. Uh, the Q&A icon appears at the bottom of your screen when you mouse over it. Um, so please submit your questions there because we're not gonna be taking any questions from the chat function today. So now I want to introduce or officially introduce, I should say, Ted Ladd. Ted is the Dean of Research and a Professor of Entrepreneurship at the Holt International Business School, and he's an instructor at Harvard University. He's won numerous teaching awards and a Fulbright Scholarship. Today, Ted is going to share with you his many techniques that he employs to generate and maintain student engagement. It's all yours, Ted. Good morning, good morning. Thank you, Sandy. Here's what I would like to do today for the next hour. I want to talk about student engagement um, for online classes and when, uh, with, with a special consideration, first of all, for online classes that are large, where you have from 75 to 700 students in the room. And the sec second special condition is where you have students who are both in the room and online simultaneously in the same class. We can call those hybrid concurrent. I've also heard high flex. So that's what we'll be talking about today. And I have six different categories of topics to discuss. Let me start with my pedagogical goals, because if these don't resonate with you, then um, perhaps some of the techniques I'm gonna share might be less important for you. My first pedagogical goal is student centricity. The pinnacle of my teaching is when the students forget I'm in the room and they continue to learn and to develop skills on their own, perhaps with some questions or guidance from me. So I want the students to have active learning sessions. The second goal for me is not to convey knowledge when I teach, but instead to convey skills. I want these students to be able to do something differently after a class than they could do before class. This means that they need to understand the skill, apply it, critique it, and extend it. The third goal of my teaching is to ensure equality of opportunity so that no student is being blocked by my own techniques in order to reach their own ambition. And when you're teaching online, equality of opportunity has a direct relationship to equality of attention. So we'll be talking about how to make um, your students feel as though they are human and connected to you. My fourth goal is to design techniques that affirm my students. I'm teaching MBAs um, and, and younger, so bachelor's and master's students, who are typically between the ages of, let's say, 18 to 25. And they desire affirmation. In fact, if I start with criticism, they shut down and they can't hear the rest of it. If I affirm them, um, their identities, their performance, not falsely, but authentically, they will actually accelerate their, their, their learning and their performance. So that's my fourth goal, is opportunities to affirm them. And my fifth goal, perhaps, is more competitive. I want to beat Facebook. I don't ban computers. I don't ban Facebook in my classrooms, either online or in person, because it is a spectacular tool to tell me in real time if I have lost their attention. I can see when they look down, start typing crazily, and then typically when they smile or laugh, because I'm not that funny. 
I can tell that I've lost them. I have 30 seconds to get them back. So it's automatic feedback and I wanna beat Facebook. But what you should perhaps be um, asking yourselves right now, even as I define my own goals and a description of where we wanna go, you should be asking, is Ted Ladd credible? So I can't answer the question for you, but I can give you some data for you to make your own determination. I teach entrepreneurship at HALT, primarily on our San Francisco campus, but I also teach on our campuses in Boston, New York, London, Shanghai, and Dubai. And primarily I'm focused on our master's courses, so our flagship MBA and our master's in international business and a master's in disruptive innovation. Um, we also have a bachelor's program and I um, move in and out of that every now and then. So over the 53 courses that I have taught at HALT, my, um, my average teaching evaluation is 4.6 and change out of five. That's the best data I can give you. You can determine whether that's satisfactory or not. I also teach at Harvard University in the summers. It's a nice change of pace in the master's in management program there. And over the last four years, I have a teaching evaluation of 4.8. But I don't think that's the whole story for my credibility. Perhaps there's more you should know. I'm an entrepreneur by training and by, by career. So I had been for 20 years an entrepreneur. Um, and some of the startups have gone on to get acquired by Google. We created the smartwatch that Google now generates. Um, got purchased by Underwriters Laboratory, another software company. I was one of the early employees of Palm. And if you remember Palm, you just dated yourself. I also do a fair amount of writing and presenting. Um, I'm a contributor at Forbes, where I write on strategy for multi-sided platforms. And I write about teaching, about pedagogy. And I present at the Academy of Management, and I write for Harvard Business Review. And then I've spent way too much time myself on the receiving end in a classroom with um, degrees from Cornell, Wharton, Johns Hopkins, and Case Western. So I'm hoping that that suggests to you that the techniques I'm gonna share with you have some basis in reality. So the first piece of engagement in the classroom starts before students get in the classroom. That's where you'll win or lose the battle. How can you get them to prepare so that they're engaged with the material before they arrive? So that's what I want to start with student preparation before class. You've heard this before, the notion of a flipped classroom where you pre-record content and then leave classroom sessions for discussion for large online classes and especially for classes that are hybrid with online and people in person, you have to switch to flipped. Here are some guidelines for when I think you should switch to flipped. If you look at your, the slides that you're going to prepare for a given session, anytime you have two slides back to back of content, pre record it and flip it. Anytime you're going to be talking for more than 10 minutes in a monologue, pre record and flip it. In these flipped videos, you can summarize theory and get students interested and curious about some of the other readings, perhaps in a textbook. You can highlight the study questions that you might be using for a case or for an example in the video, again, to stimulate their curiosity to delve into those other reading materials. This also lets you situate a case or an example inside of theory. Um, the online this, this flipped method also means that your online students and your hybrid students, the ones in the classroom, start with an entirely level playing field. Everybody gets to see you. Um, I have done a little bit of research on this. These are preliminary results from a study I did that looking at the practices of 85 different professors, do they use flipped or not, and correlating that with um, the student evaluations with uh, from 20,000 students sitting in courses uh, that those professors had offered. And there's some interesting conclusions. The first is that those professors who used the flip technique do significantly better with teaching evaluations than those who do not use flipped. But there's an added extra detail here. Male professors who use flipped do slightly but significantly better in their teaching evaluations. Female professors who use flipped do dramatically better in their teaching evaluations. I don't have an explanation for that difference, 
but I thought it was an interesting piece that emerged from the, from the statistics. To do flip, there are lots of different technologies that exist out there. You can do something as simple as do a voice narration for PowerPoint. It's already built in. Or you can do a Zoom call with yourself, record it, and post that to your students. I happen to use a, um, a slightly different piece of software from a company called Panopto. Let me show you what it looks like. The, the students see a slide which, where all the text is fully searchable. They can move through the slides if they want. They see an outline. The little red circle in this screen shows that students can make me talk faster, which it turns out is one of their favorite tools to use. I think that's hilarious. Um, and then I intentionally put a screenshot up here of me looking awkward. You've seen me already for a few minutes and perhaps this is my natural posture. But I was talking with some instructional designers at Harvard at one point, and I asked them, should I spend the extra time to upgrade the quality of my flipped videos? Will that matter? And their response was no. That in fact, the big difference is having going from no video to a video, there's not that much increase in uh, content retention or student satisfaction if you buff it out with great sound, audio, um, and transitions. Second thing for um, student preparation for class I want to highlight is prioritization of materials. Now, we as professors are deeply immersed in our own particular categories of, and disciplines, and so therefore we list lots of readings. We can't do that anymore. Not for online students, because if we overwhelm them with too many choices of reading, they won't do any of it, and then they won't be engaged in class. So I do a simple prioritization. Here's what's required. Typically, that's my video, a textbook reading, and a contemporary example. I list things that are recommended for students to use um, and the, for students to look at, and that those recommendations can be other contemporary examples, even counterexamples. I have a category for optional, which frequently point to deeper information for people who start to get curious. And then my final category is geek out. And that category has academic papers in it. But more recently, what I have been doing for online engagement is to shift from written cases to multimedia cases. And let me give you an example of that. This was a bit surprisingly easy to do. Um, I had called up Sasha Mornell, who's the CEO of a, um, a Get My Boat, which is an online boat sharing platform. And he and I had a conversation on Zoom for two hours. I took his uh, conversations in, and put it into small clips in multiple chapters. And students connect with this. It's, it's sort of like the flipped classroom, but instead of me, it's a CEO that they get to follow for lots of different sessions. Sasha has also been nice enough to jump into the final session of many of my courses, and I've recorded those, and I'll put those into small clips. So as a result, this multimedia case not only grows, but remains current, because I can show where the idea started all the way up to the last time Sasha and I talked. This was remarkably easy. I'm not particularly tech advantaged. Um, so this is for even for the non techies out there. I want to move. Um, let me check to see if there are questions here. How do you get students to to watch the videos before the class session? Um, Mark, the way that I do this is, and we'll see this in a second when I talk about participation and how I grade participation, but mostly these videos are partly skills-based and partly entertainment. I'm intentionally trying to create a human connection with them that is hopefully full of energy, a few terrible jokes in there. If, they, if I can get them to watch one video early in the course, typically I can hook them to watch all of the rest of the videos for the course. I also luckily um, don't have to force my students to at least dip their toe into the material before each class. So it is not that hard, uh, it's not like I'm pu pulling teeth here. Let me move on from here 
to talk about how I design an individual session. Um, and the key here is 20 minute sprints. Now, you've heard this before too, that we wanna keep as professors, keep changing the activity, not necessarily the topic, you can stay on the topic, but we need to change the activity. There are different ways to do this for online classes that are scalable. In other words, you can have 70 or 700 students and still make it pretty seamless and personable. We're gonna talk more about a few of those in a second, team exercises and plenary discussion. So we'll get there in a second, but I wanna mention a few different ones. The first is if you're having 20 minute sprints, you can intentionally, at least in your own mind, and maybe even explicitly to your students, declare that this 20 minutes, I'm gonna be focused on my Zoom screen and students online. And for the next 20 minutes, I'll focus on the students in the room and you can alternate back and forth in order to share attention. Even saying this explicitly to students will help them remind you who you're supposed to be focusing on at that particular instance. Um, I also, as a middle-aged guy, have um, realized that I need to take better care of my body, so I started yoga. I'm terrible at it. Still cannot touch my toes, nowhere near. But I have invited my yoga instructor several times into some of my classes for 15 minutes of chair yoga. And I also leave my screen on and I invite people to leave their screens on if they want. It's incredibly humbling and a human connection to see everybody's feet up in the air. And that's the only thing you see on Zoom screens. Um, I also embrace the non-class related cameos. So if I'm speaking with somebody and I see on a Zoom screen, that somebody's spouse is wanting through the screen or that there's a child who is wants to say good night to their parent, I will ask with the student's permission to sit them down and interview them for three minutes. Because I look at, I study and teach on things like multi-sided platforms, which are called, it's, it's in the sharing economy, Uber and Airbnb, I'll ask a seven-year-old what sharing means or I'll ask a spouse the last time they took Uber and describe their experience. These are humanizing moments that just change the pace of the class and um, also give me an opportunity to affirm the child or the spouse, which is far and away the best way to affirm an individual student. Um, I also do simulations in class, um, and I can do these either individual or, with, uh, or in teams, and I was daunted by this idea of simulations. And so luckily with the nice folks at Forio, I decided to build my own simulation. I'm not a coder. This is a terrible confession for a guy who spent 20 years in Silicon Valley working with developers. I don't know how to do this. So Forio, as this platform, allows you to simply build an Excel spreadsheet and plug it into their software and it works as a simulation. Let me show you what this looks like without too much effort. This is a simulation that I built on boat sharing. Incredibly simple and typically this is the second highest rated class of my courses. The highest rated is when our guest lecturer like Sasha Mornell comes back and talks about his case. Simulations are easily scalable. It doesn't matter whether people are online or in the room and there's really no limit to the debrief because it calculates all of the results in person for how many students you can have in the room. Unbelievably engaging and useful, especially if your intention is to teach skills. Um, one other piece that I wanna talk about, one other option um, is show and tell. So I do show and tell where I'll say, here's a theory, you have five minutes in your room to find, in your house to find an item that matches this particular theory or to find a picture on your computer that matches this particular theory. So let me give you a quick example of that. When I talk about switching costs, which are the reasons that platform users stick, for example, on Uber instead of going to Lyft, or in this case, there's low switching costs because at, so they, they move from Uber to Lyft. I talk about myself, I say, listen, here's my, our, me and our recent pack trip, and I have a switching cost for that particular horse named Drama, and I walk through why that's a switching cost. I'm humanizing myself and 
by randomly popping around the online room, I can ask other people to bring their whole selves to class, not just a small piece of it. A few more notes on, um, on this 20 minute sprint. Um, and I wanna talk quickly about breaks. I don't take breaks in my class. They're three hours long. If I take a formal break, say here's 15 minutes, go do whatever you want. Typically what happens is that they go for 15 minutes, they check their email, they check their news. They're maybe gone for 20 minutes. It's tough to get them back in the room, especially when they're online. And then their brain is somewhere else for another 10 minutes. If I do that twice, that means that in a three hour class, I only got two hours of concentration. I don't want that. I want their brain for all three hours. So instead, the way I do breaks is when I put people into teams, we'll talk more about that in a second, I say it's up to the team as the first question that they should consider if and when they want to take a break. What typically happens is the breaks become much shorter because now they're responsible to a smaller group of people. It's not an anonymous departure from a large classroom. This also means that typically they're only doing a two minute bio break, but they're doing them at different times during their 20 minutes that they have for team time. The reason this matters is if you also have students on campus who are in their teams and taking a break, this staggers trips to the cafe or to the restroom so that they can maintain social distance. Let me move from there to talk about, to talk about um, teamwork. So, Teamwork is, if you can set it up, not just um, an engaging way to get people to learn skills, but also can be scalable for larger classrooms. And I've designed my techniques so that they work online or in person. Let me um, give you a, the first example. I typically start every class within a few minutes, literally of starting class, with a, a pair or a trio negotiation. I teach business, so negotiation is feasible. Let me give you a quick screenshot of what this could look like. So this is a two-sided vote negotiation. I set it up with Google Forms, free, easy. After these, Zoom automatically puts people in randomized pairs. The first thing I say is decide whether you're the buyer or the seller. They click on this button, it takes them to the background for the negotiation. I can also collect lots of data for the debrief based on this kind of exercise, but it doesn't matter whether I have two people, 20 people, 200 people, or 2,000 people, that particular type of exercise scales beautifully and everybody gets to participate actively with somebody else to apply the material. But those are sort of the exceptions, those randomized team breakouts. Most of my teamwork in my classes is based on a set team that um, is comprised for the entire duration of the course. And they're working on a particular project towards the, that, that will culminate in a final presentation. I'll talk more about that in a second. But when I put them in teams, um, I have a few different important messages. Um, I give them a very specific question that is not a binary. I, do nev I never ask them a yes or no question. I want them to apply theory and to apply a skill. So yes and no don't really work. The other problem with yes and no is that if there's a chance that an answer could be dead wrong, that undermines my ability to affirm everybody. So I'm looking for good answers and I'll highlight even better answers. So I don't ask for questions of fact. I don't ask for questions that relate to what happened in the case or in the example. I'll say, here's what's at stake in this instance, or here's a problem. Don't solve the problem as a team. Come up with together the optimal approach that you would use to solve this particular problem and the information that you'd need to input into this process. So that can come up with a sort of a rich answer. The debrief, for this um, happens to be very easy if you use some polling software. Not Zoom polls. Zoom polls are, are, are fine, but they're multiple choice only, and I don't want multiple choice. Those lead you to these binary or at least categorical answers where some are right and some are wrong. I don't want that. 
I want open-ended answers. Let me show you an example of what this looks like for some software that I use called Poll Everywhere. We also at Halt use Mentimeter, so that it, it works pretty well. Um, this was also about Get My Boat, the multimedia case that we use, and I asked them about how other com companies would compete against Get My Boat. This software allows me to, first of all, see all of the answers as they come in. So even though they're gone for 20 minutes, I can start to prepare my remarks for debrief. I can highlight those answers that I think are particularly spectacular. And when students come back into the room, I can highlight the answer and ask the student or the team that came up with this particular answer to explain more about it. Opportunities for um, affirmation. And this is randomized. I don't know who wrote these particular answers. By the way, there is a function here with, with these polling software that if somebody writes something inappropriate or deeply damaging, you can indeed trace them back through IP addresses. And I tell students that in the beginning of the class, don't misbehave here. Um, and so far, knock on wood, none of my students have said anything that is inappropriate or offensive. So, but this way I can, but I, they're anonymous to me. So this means that I'm not projecting any of my bias about who might have a good answer into the class. The other benefit to an open polling system like this um, is that I can see if there are consistently wrong answers. And if there are lots of consistently wrong answers, that means it's pilot error. I messed up. So that allows me in real time to go back and explain or clean up some mistakes that I have made. The other, um, the other aspect of a poll, if you, if you want to use it, is that you can broadcast the poll results to the students or the teams while they're doing their exercise and you can ask them or you can tell them if the answer that you would have posted to the poll is already posted on the poll, you have to come up with a different answer. This adds some time, some speed, some competition and instead of actually frustrating students, I find that it actually gets us deeper into interesting nuances for some of these questions. Um, than, than if everybody had the same answer that they thought was the correct one. So I'm a big fan of polling. Let me grab um, a few questions. Jonathan asks um, the 20 minute split. So hopefully Jonathan, what I've been demonstrating is different ways that, that, for what that 20 minutes could look like. It's not, I lecture for 20 minutes, you talk for 20 minutes. I don't do that. Instead, I'll say there's a, to, uh, paired negotiation for 20 minutes. We'll do a 20 minute debrief. I'll put you into a simulation for 20 minutes. I'll have a team exercise for your project for 20 minutes. We'll do another 20 minute debrief. We'll do 20 minutes of show and tell. We'll stick in there 20 minutes of chair yoga. And before you know it, the course is over, but every 20 minutes we've been moving along. I do not take any of those 20 minutes for me to pop back into a lecture mode. Let me move from here on to, oh, I said, hold on, let me grab some questions for a second. Um, Stacy is going back to this flipped classroom notion, which is, I think, vital for getting students to be engaged. Um, and she reports that some students complain that, that the flipped classroom is students teaching themselves. And here is my response to that. First, the video that I'm having them watch is me. That's important, even if, well, hold on. Let me, that was about to come out with a very arrogant sentence, so let me change that. There are millions of, the peop of people in the world who already have explained the theories that I use better than I have. Even though I can find all of those, I intentionally put um, me talking about this particular theory so that, first of all, they feel connected to me, to a person that they know and that knows them, and that demonstrates that if they're gonna sign up for the school, they're not gonna get external videos, they're gonna get me in the video. So that's the first piece for this. The second piece is that um, students, just because they hear a theory, aren't teaching, they're not learning the theory. The key is not understanding its application. So even if they watch a video from me, they don't have the skill yet that we've been discussing. 
So I'm intentionally in class moving from understanding the material, which they did before class, to applying the material or critiquing the material or extending and improvising based on the material. So if you, once you do that once, you can, in your very first class, you can demonstrate to students that the flipped classroom method doesn't reduce the progress that uh, or expectations on the professor for teaching. If anything, it increases the expectations on the professor to help figure out how to curate this material, but also it ensures that the student understands that they have a huge responsibility in learning, that they're not an empty vessel into which we pour knowledge. They are acting living human beings that have to practice and apply in order to critique, extend, um, and deploy some of these ideas. So um, another quick question on teamwork. Zoom has a couple of different features um, for teams. You can preset teams in Zoom through your learning management system for team composition. So team one is always these four or five people. So, and that's fine. You can hit the button when you go into a class that will put all of the students into those preset teams. Simultaneously, it doesn't erase those settings. You can also hit the button on Zoom that allows people to be put into randomized pairs or trios. So that's, um, that's how I can do multiple different composition of team. Let me move on now to plenary discussions. So for plenary discussions, how do we get students moving in the classroom? Perhaps we've done a team exercise, perhaps we've done a simulation, and we're all together, 70 or 700, and we'd like to do the debrief. What did we just learn, and where is their potential confusion? Just as with student preparation, I had one key answer flipped, so too for plenary discussions do I have one key answer, the cold call. Now, we have all seen legal dramas where people, in, legal professors, typically employ the cold call and the Socratic method brutally, where it's designed not just to try and make people scared of the content, but to demean them as people. Let's not use cold calls like that. Instead, the way I use cold calls is to invite other voices into the room. There, there are many benefits to the cold call. One of them is it takes my own bias out of the equation. I had seen some research a couple of years ago that suggests that professors call on people who look like them. I don't want to do that. Uh, even subconsciously, I don't want to allow that bias into my own teaching practice. So the cold call intentionally uses a randomized roster of students. And I'll sh I won't show them the list because I don't want them to know where they are on the list, but I'll show them sort of, sort of from afar. I'll cover up the, the field that has the names on it to show them literally I'm using the random function in Excel to ensure that my biases are removed from this particular equation. I also have a very simple grading scheme. You get a B when I call on you if you give me the right answer. You get a C if you give me the wrong answer. You give me an F if you don't try it all or it's clear you're unprepared. Let me go back up to the top. You get an A if it's the right answer with not just evidence from the theory and from the case, but also perhaps evidence from other cases. Or if you say, here's the answer you're looking for, but I disagree with that answer, automatic A, especially if they do that concisely. Everybody understands in my classroom that this is the rubric by which I grade participation. A um, couple other tips that I use here. Um, I Presumably some of my students are watching right, right now, so this might disappoint them. But on my roster, I also have the team number. So for students in the room, I ask them to sit by team, and I have a map on the board that says I want team one there, team two there, team three there. When I ask a question, Sandy from team one, I'll look in that general direction. Sandy will say, oh my goodness, he knows who I am. I'm guessing. I know where she, about where she's located, but it gives them this connection, this perception of connection and familiarity. Once Sandy answers a cold call, I do know who she is and where she's sitting and what she's thinking. Another important um, tip for cold calls is to give students multiple different wordings or phrasings or deconstruction. So just asking a question, 
what is the solution to this particular case can be daunting. So I intentionally have prepared for these cold call questions ways to, to be more gently, to more gently approach the answer. What's the problem or who had the problem or where was the problem or what's at stake so that I can walk the students into a great answer. My goal for a cold call is for them to answer well. So if they answer, if they start to get nervous or anxious, I'll carry them through every single student. I would love to give all A's for participation because everybody has in class, out loud, answered one of these extemporaneous cold call questions. There's one other trick that I use for cold calls, um, and I do this on the first couple of classes for any course where they're new to me and perhaps they're new to cold calling. I will, I can see the list of who's going to be coming up in the cold calls, uh, cold call list, and I'll go to the first few people on the list and look them up on LinkedIn to find a few pieces of personal information on them. So, for example, Sandy, who's my host today, our host today at Harvard Business Publishing, went to Florida State University. It's on her LinkedIn page. So I would say, Sandy, tell me about watching the Seminoles and Chief Osceola and riding the horse renegade into the football stadium. What it means is that Sandy would respond and talk about that experience. It's not a hard question. It's based directly on her own experience. I can affirm her immediately, and then I can say, Sandy, that's awesome. Thank you very much for telling us about the renegade, the horse at Florida State University. Now let's move on to the case. What's the problem in this particular business instance? instance? So I've taken some of the anxiety and the pain out of it, and I've allowed her to humanize herself, to connect with her other students, and it's given me yet one more opportunity to affirm Sandy before we move on to the harder topics. Um, the, this, um, this also works for hybrid. It works well for hybrid um, where you have online students and students in the classroom, but you might consider one modification to go from a cold call to a warm call. And a warm call would mean that you would post the list of two or three students who in the next 20 minute sprint, you might be calling on to answer some questions. And that just means that they get prepared more easily to determine how they can mute, unmute, how you, they can be close to a microphone if they're in the room um, or prepared for the camera. Um, I don't do warm calls in general unless I have these hybrid situations because I have found that the warm call actually increases the anxiety of students instead of decreasing it. It means that for the entire three hours, they're worried about when they're going to come up uh, on my list. Um, I have received tons of comments. I would say this is that my cold calls are the, mo the most frequently mentioned aspect of my teaching in my comments, uh, for, in my student evaluations. And they run about four in favor to every one against for my younger students. And that ratio improves as I go from teaching 20 year olds to teaching 30 year olds, it improves. And typically they say, thank you for forcing me to think about this. Even if you didn't cold call, I was preparing a response. It also dramatically improves preparation beforehand because nobody wants to get caught by surprise without having been prepared in front of their fellow students. Um, but it, it also makes sure that those people in the class who are always prepared and always with their hand up aren't dominating the discussion. What do I do with them, these very enthusiastic volunteers? First of all, um, I call on them some. It takes me maybe the first half of the first session to determine who fits in this category. Some, typically, they're prepared, sometimes not. But they're always right in front raising, raising their hand. Um, this is particularly tough when I have their other professors who teach in a program with me who are focused on class participation based on who they remember talking at the end of the class. That's one of the reasons that my system for class participation, where I'm marking them as we go for how they participate, under, uh, reduces that need for FaceTime. But these students, um, I typically, first of all, ask them, answer a few questions or let them answer a few questions, pose a few questions to them. I might mark them in my participation book as having got, done well that day, even if I didn't give them a cold call. But I'll also send them an email after class, affirming them and saying, I love your enthusiasm. I hope you're not offended. 
by me trying to bring quieter voices in the room, that email keeps them motivated, keeps them engaged, and demonstrates that they are part of a learning community, not just one student trying to um, progress. I think that that, hint, that leaves it for plenary. I want to move to assessments now. Um, how can you assess for, um, for long, for large online classes? I have moved away um, from doing online exams for a couple of reasons. First is there's always problems with software and bandwidth, and that's anxiety producing and logistically confusing for everybody. But there's also a problem when everybody is online and taking an exam, even if you give it within a couple hour window, with the temptation for students to share information via WhatsApp around the edges. And I don't want them to put them in that particular circumstance. I think that temptation is understandably heightened by the reality right now that many people around the world are suffering, anxiety is high. So I, sort of, I want to remove that temptation. I also have a problem with exams because the output is a dead end. If somebody writes a good exam, I read it, I enjoy it, but it, it doesn't go anywhere else. There's nobody else whose live, lives are improved by writing a good exam. And finally, after 25 years in Silicon Valley, I have yet to find an instance where everybody, anybody gave me a problem, put me in a closet for three hours without access to a phone, a conversation or the web and said, please solve this problem now. So I don't think that exams are a good reflection of what the business world, the working world will require from our students. So here's what I do instead. I have teams in the projects that I was talking about earlier. I don't have them present in class or on Zoom. That's not only awkward, it's boring enough to listen to me in class. I don't want them to have to worry about the anxiety and messing with technology, especially if I have some online and some hybrid. So instead, I ask all teams to record a video of their final presentation. Some piece of the project is customer facing. Another piece of the project is based on theory and self critique of that particular idea. These videos are so much better than just a bunch of students recording their own Zoom conversation. These have animation and background music and transitions. They're well edited. They have done a spectacular job of demonstrating a particular idea um, and the skills that I had hoped that they would learn. That's the team assignment. Then for the individual assessment, I ask each student in the class to critique two of those team presentations. There are many learning management systems, we use Canvas, that can do this peer review function behind the scenes. It can automate it. There are some benefits to this. I've removed this time pressure. People have typically two days after receiving the video to hand in their critiques. I write the template for the base of the critique, and that template is actually incredibly easy to write because it's the out course outline. So it's, it's not a problem. I'm literally saying, please apply the skill you've had to this particular team's idea. This also means that the output of this individual critique at the end of the course, which is the bulk of the student's grade, is useful. I can return that critique back to the team. Each team then is receiving, in addition to my comments, 10 or 15 long detailed sets of comments from their peers. So we've hopefully improved their learning outcomes as well. Let me move now to one last bonus topic, if you'll allow me. And I wanna talk about tech setup. So this is my office back in Wyoming. I'm in San Francisco right now, but this is my office back in Wyoming where I've been for the last six months. And there are a couple things to note. Um, I, the saddle is just because I sit there when I'm listening to long conference calls to entertain myself. But I have a laptop and an external monitor, great, with a separate keyboard, piece of cake. I use wireless headphones, but I have wired headphones as a backup. I don't use virtual backgrounds. You can see from behind me that I'm not doing that because I worry that, first of all, they ghost a little bit, right? Because you've all seen these faint edges. But also, they actually, in my opinion, dehumanize the speaker. How many people have you seen with the Golden Gate Bridge in the background? That's not unique or personal related to their own history or their own personality. 
So instead, I have a pretty simple wall um, with a guitar, um, which I every now and then try and play badly. Another piece to note here is I have a few ring lights, the um, LED ring lights that increase, improve the lighting, $12 at Amazon. And then I have a cellular connected iPad just above that has a couple of different functions. One of them is I can see exactly what you see. So I never have to ask, can you see my screen? Am I muted or unmuted? Am I moving? Am I connected? I can see exactly what you see. The other benefit to this is because that iPad is logged in as a different user to Zoom, if there are any technical difficulties on my own computer, I can quickly switch over to Zoom seamlessly. I think we're to the age, to the era right now for online teaching where tech problems are inevitable. Hopefully we can deal with these tech problems quietly without outwardly lamenting or explaining our troubleshooting. That just adds anxiety to students. Just be quiet and go about and fix it. And students are patient, they'll wait. Um, but also because online teaching is now so common and we all know that tech problems are inevitable, we all need to have several different contingency plans to ensure that class is not interrupted. Could be as easy as dialing in. Share your slides ahead of time and dial in. I think we need to make sure that we are um, adhering to that particular practice. Let me do this now. I want to take a few questions that have come in and then I'll do a wrap in a few minutes. Um, Sharon asks how, um, sort of similar to an earlier question, how can we get students with four, um, in classes of 400 to watch flipped because they don't have the discipline or the motivation? Sharon, um, I entirely empathize with that problem and it's unbelievably frustrating. Far and away, the worst part of my job is getting unmotivated students motivated. And the best way that I can do that is to create a human connection, to affirm them whenever I can, and to make those videos entertaining, energetic, personal, um, and concise. So I, um, unfortunately, I don't have any better way to do that. I don't track who has watched the video and who hasn't. I have other peers who will start the class with an online quiz based on what was in the video. And I can do that sometimes as well, but I sort of feel as though I'm, that this is, if I can't make the students watch the video by being entertaining and informative, then um, I sort of extra, I'm adding insult to injury by also putting a quiz on it. Um, Ian asks, do I have the same level of preparation and engagement from a student after they've gotten their cold call? Ian, the participation from students after they've gotten their cold call goes way up. I am amazed at the number of students who are normally quiet. I ask them a cold call, they do well. I, hopefully I lead them through it. I make sure that they do well. And they then discover that not only do they have a voice that other people wanna to listen to, but they have great ideas because I've been able to affirm them in front of all of their peers. Many of these students move quickly from the, I don't want a cold call realm to, not only do I love cold calls, but I'm gonna raise my hand all the time. That is, the cold call is when most often I see the light go on. It's when I see the student decide, choose actively that their own ambition matters and that their own capacities can reach that ambition. Let me take a few more questions. Um, Elizabeth asks, don't I miss the energy I get from personal interaction with students? First of all, Elizabeth, I still get personal interaction. Much of it is online. I miss the water cooler stuff. I miss the joking around in the hallways. I don't know if you can tell from my personality, but I'm somewhat of a goof. Um, at least that's how my wife describes me. And I miss that, the ability to goof around sort of one-on-one -on -one with students. I'll still goof around in the classroom. I'm not intending to be this perfect buttoned up professional. I'm intentionally trying to bring my mistakes, my humanness. Hopefully you've seen some of that today. Hopefully I'm emulating that for you today. So I still remain energized even after an online class. I get exhausted 
but I'm energized when I start. Um, and I still get to have these, these connections. Um, Nicolene says that um, her students have all turned off their screen and it's difficult to get a conversation going. I agree, Nicolene, I won't allow it. I require that students have their screens on. And if they don't have their screen on, there are a couple different things I can do. At the very end of this line is I'll mark them absent for class, but in the middle, when I put team, uh, students into team exercises, I'll send them a quick note saying, is there anything I can help you with? Are you experiencing any particular problem, technology or personal, that I can help you with right now so that you could engage more in class? If I do that once for a student, first of all, five cameras go on because they're all talking to each other, but also that camera stays on for a long period of time. I had to do that once, the camera was on and I was looking at the student, happened to be on one of my Zoom screens and he wasn't blinking. He had put up a picture of himself watching the show um, and a quick note to him. And at the next time when students went live, he was there in person. Carlos asks, how do you make present calculations and don't lose the interest of the students? A couple of different ways. First, Carlos, flip it. Put these calculations in your pre-recorded videos. And um, that's the first thing. Second thing is have them do the calculations. Put a, give a problem to a team and say to the team, you can use the tools on, on Zoom to annotate a shared screen or some other software program that you'd like to use around the edges. You can do these calculations. And then have, when you come back to debrief, have a student present the calculations. We don't need to talk nearly as much as we do, um, <laughs> this seminar notwithstanding. Um, how do you deal with students who use the raise hand function, but it's hard to see them um, resulting in students feeling that they have been ignored? First of all, because I focus on cold calls, the raised hand function becomes less important. Typically, the people who raise hands in my classes have true questions of confusion or inquiry. They're not trying to make a point because those are based on my cold call system. Um, I have had uh, some problems with the raised hand function in that um, I forget which order they've arrived and I wanna respect the order that they've arrived. Um, and so that's where I luckily have a teaching assistant who will chat to me privately saying, here's the order of questions you need to take. And I'll bake that in. That could be an entire 20 minute activity. We've just done something. We've had a plenary discussion. Now let's see if we have questions. I'll have extra activities in reserve in case there are none. Um, how satisfied uh, is the overall experience of online teaching for you on a scale of one to 10? And how, uh, how are student satisfaction? We measure student satisfaction at halt all the time. And we found that for the last six months, student satisfaction actually went up. I think it happened for a few reasons. First is they were proud and empathetic of the way that all of us, the entire community shifted literally from one day to the next in person to online. So that, rec that demonstrated to them that we were being responsive and careful with their health. My own satisfaction with online teaching goes from, oh, let's call it a nine and a half normally. You never wanna say 10 because then you're gonna get struck by lightning. Nine and a half down to perhaps an eight and a half. I miss that direct interaction. I miss seeing their energy, I'm, um, but I get most of it out of online teaching. Here's what I wanna do now. I wanna, I wanna wrap, I wanna close. There are lots of other questions. I apologize that I haven't gotten to all of them. I look forward to having future conversations with you. Um, I'm pretty easy to find out on the intertubes. So let me con give you a conclusion. Here are the six things that we talked about. Let me um, remind you what some of these conclusions were. My goal, and hopefully your goal, is student centricity. If we constantly remember the student experience for online classes, I think we'll make better decisions and it will turn out, I think we'll make simpler decisions. For student preparation, flip the classroom method, pre-record everything, and prioritize the materials. For session design, I do 20-minute sprints. For teamwork, I have very specific questions, and then I have open-ended polls that not only help them produce something, they have an artifact at the end of their exercise, 
that they can show to other people, but also it leads directly into a debrief. For plenary discussions, I do cold calls, but with a pretty transparent, clear system to track all of this information. And then finally, for assessments, I use the video of team presentations followed up by peer reviews from individuals that is the majority of their grade. Last thing I wanna say before, I, before we finish, and Sandy comes back on, I wanna end with gratitude. We as a community, you as teachers, are intentionally trying to not just entertain your students or have them do well in their own lives, you are trying to, and you are making progress in improving our communities, local communities and global communities. And this is especially important right now because the world is suffering from a variety of different reasons. And you are helping students employ evidence, make better decisions, treat each other better, lead better, follow better, read better, write better. You are the key to how we emerge from some of these contemporary terrible events and horrible tragedies into a world where I think we'll have more health, more justice, hopefully more happiness, more economic benefits for everybody. Thank you for the work that you do. And I hope that what I've done today um, has provided you with a few ways for you to do your work better. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, that was excellent. Um, and thank you everyone for joining today. I hope you found today's, today's presentation helpful. And now I wanna draw your attention to the links that are listed on this slide where you can find additional information. First of all, if you don't have an educator account on the HBP Education website, I encourage you to register, it's free. And doing this will give you access to teaching notes, course planning tools, free trials to simulations, and of course it gives you access to our catalog, our entire catalog of HBP cases and simulations. The second link is to a resources page that we created. We've curated resources that are helpful in teaching online and in hybrid classrooms. And in closing, I am excited to announce our new online seminar. After hearing concerns and questions and feedback from our customers, as well as our webinar audiences, we've partnered with two of our most experienced seminar, seminar facilitators to create a new seminar that will provide practical skills to help educators teach in multiple formats, online, hybrid, and in person. Seminar attendees will learn techniques for building community, engaging students, orchestrating effective synchronous case discussions, board management, and other key elements to consider when preparing to teach. This is a virtual seminar, and it will take place over three days, mornings only, October 29th, 30th, and 31st. Certificates of completion will be awarded to attendees who complete all sessions of the seminar. The links to register for the new seminar along with the links to register as an educator and to access additional resources are posted in chat now. They can also be found on the HVP Education website. I'm going to keep chat open for a few minutes to give you time to explore with these links. Thank you again for spending time with us today. Thank you, Ted, and please do connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Be well. Thank you, everybody. I wish you huge success in the future.